when you move from, uh, from uh, two-dimensional uh, critical points to 3D, you actually have two types of saddles. You have a one saddle where it's uh, a minimum in, uh, in two dimensions and a maximum in, another, in the third, and then you have a two saddle, which is the inverse. It's, uh, it's uh, two maximum and a minimum. Um, and we define a function as a Morse function if it's smooth and all of its critical, critical points are isolated and non-degenerate. Um, which is uh, generally a good assumption for the continuous uh, uh, phenomena that we're examining in spatial visualization and scientific data. This is um, a even when you have a grid, even when you have uh, the, the occasional discontinuity somewhere in the grid, the underlying assumption is that these data are all some continuous phenomenon underneath, and you can reconstruct that with interpolation. So uh, here we're going to talk about level set topology. So we'll talk about reed graphs, contour trees, and verge trees. The simplest example of a topological structure is a reed graph. And here we're looking at, I guess, more explicit geometry where the value of the function is actually this the height. So this is the, the Dunkin' Donuts example, uh, which is probably the uh, uh, quintessential example of topology. Um, and you can sort of see uh, what happens to this uh, uh, this function over height as you dip the donut into into your cup of coffee. Now you can see your you go from having one connected component to having two connected components, and then you have one again. And if you represent this as a graph, uh, so essentially sweeping along the z direction, uh, you'll end up with a graph that looks like this, this or a structure that looks more like this. Cast. And this is what we call the reed graph. So here, the vertices of the reed graph are the critical points. The arcs of the graph represent the connected components. Um, and the algorithm is really simple. It basically is locate the critical, the critical points and then connect them. Um, so the, the donut example is you know, almost trivial to do. It gets a little bit more complicated when you have um, a higher genus uh, uh, geometric data sets. For example, some of the this Stanford scanning repository data sets. Cast. Really, any sort of geometry that has holes in it, that's where you'd like to build a reed graph. And there was this uh, a paper from Valeria Piscucci and collaborators in 2007 that built reed graphs from arbitrary, arbitrary geometry. Now, this is really more of a graphics and, I guess, pure math interest. Uh, how do we actually apply this to visualization? Well, this gets interesting in visualization. Um, in really determining um, how the isosurfaces of data, uh, how the level of sets of scalar text. fields end up being important. So go, even if you're thinking, forgetting isosurfaces and going back to volume rendering and transfer functions, we have this question of how do you design a good transfer function? And one of the first um, ideas for how to design a transfer function came from Chandra Bajaj in his Viz 97, paper, Viz 97 paper on the contour spectrum, which is really building a hierarchy of ISO values and sort of creating the transfer function from this hierarchy of ISO values. Um, and later on, uh, people found that they weren't actually interested in, in using this just to be able to better render a volume, uh, to be able to create an interesting transfer function or relevant senses of sets of isosurfaces. They were actually interested in the tree structure itself that more or less defined the data set over range. So there was a very, I'd say, seminal paper by Hamish Carr in 2003 uh, about computing contour trees in all dimensions. And the contour tree is sort of a simplified reed graph that sweeps over um, the range uh, from minimum to maximum. And then it does a separate sweep from maximum to minimum, intersects these together, and ends up with a graph that represents more or less scalar field range value. And uh, it lets you classify the entire data set that way. So you end up with a tree that perfectly describes what's happening with function range over an entire scalar field. And there's an even slightly simpler version of this, which is just one half of the contour tree, so just the, the join tree or the merge tree, and using this to, uh, to uh, analyze uh, real-world data sets, uh, especially from fluid dynamics. And there's also a much more confusing, but um, more or less the same principle for multi-field data, where you can decompose a two-field data set into not a tree, but something called a joint contour net. Um, and this is useful for data sets where you're, you're, interesting in, you're interested in a change occurring. For example, going from 
one blob to two uh, as a plutonium nucleus splits. But you're not exactly sure what, what time step or what range values this happens because the split uh, happens with respect to two fields, uh, proton and neutron density. And you want to have this idea of, okay, at this point in time, with respect to both fields, this is definitely a two blob data set as opposed to a one blob data set. So this is where this technique is useful for. And most recently, I'm just going to finish uh, talking about uh, contour trees at multi-fields. Uh, so I'll just say this is a pretty active ongoing area of research. Uh, the, vis the best paper of this this year was something uh, on, uh, was a paper on Jacobi fiber surfaces, which are similar to the, um, the uh, 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 fiber surface concept that I talked about in, the, uh, in last class, uh, talking about, uh, about isosurfaces. Except here, you're actually, um, you're actually building a reap space over multivariate uh, data sets, over bivariate data sets. And you're using the fiber surfaces in the range so over this histogram to sort of peel off areas of interest. So it's a lot like what I showed with multivariate transfer functions, 2D transfer functions, except here you're actually decomposing the range space and using that to classify domain space for any sort of general multi-field data. So this is, I think, a very exciting, exciting piece of work uh, because it's a lot like what you could do with volume rendering before, but there's a lot less guesswork. It's sort of intrinsically driven by the topology of the multi-fields that you have. So, so far we've really talked about topology of value uh, for single field, for multi-field, um, and it's, it's the contour tree and merge trees and uh, joint contour nets and, uh, and uh, Jacobi fiber surfaces. They're really working in this space. Uh, but the other area of interest in topology is analyzing the gradient of the scalar field and using that to decompose uh, data into monotonically increasing, decreasing, or other regions. And the key structure here is something called the Morse-Mail complex. So this is an idea of what the Morse-Mail complex looks like. If you have a data set where you have maxima at the blue dots, so you have saddles that are kind of mixed, and you have minima that are white dots, you can actually uh, decompose it into something called the ascending manifolds and the descending manifolds. Um, so the ascending manifolds are more or less where the gradient's going up, and the descending manifolds are more or less where the gradient's going down. And when you intersect these, uh, you end up having cells of the morse mail complex uh, where you end up having uh, intersections between ascending and descending manifolds. Um, this, this structure, this morse mail complex, is great because it actually decomposes your data set into these uh, gradient regions that obey the same behavior, and you end up with sort of simple graph representations like this. Um, so I, again, this, uh, you end up having a, a group of cells uh, composed of uh, minima, maxima, saddles, again, the critical points, the vertices. Um, and the way you'd use this would be to try to take really noisy, really entropic data sets where you're interested in sort of overall summary behavior, but not necessarily what's spatially going on in one pocket or one fold this or you know, one bubble. Uh, so they were using this for sort of rally taylor turbulence. We're going to talk about this a lot more in, uh, in the Globus lecture um, to, to sort of summarize this very nasty entropic data set into its, its, top, its topological skeleton. Um, and going back to the simple high field examples, uh, there's the, the seminal work from Herbert Edelsbrunner, where he uh, took a look at the Puget Sound high field and decomposed that into a relatively simple uh, Morse Mail complex that was showing the overall topology of the whole region. Um, and it's, it, the idea is that it's a lot easier to look at this from the Morse Mail complex and get a sense of how the data set behaves rather than uh, looking over, uh, look, looking at the full original grid. Um, and there are places where you can actually compute the morse mail complex, but it maybe doesn't work as well as you'd expect. Um, so, so there's this uh, another Rally taylor data set that uh, when uh, you actually can generate the morse mail complex from, but it's almost impossible to simplify. Uh, so simplifying morse mail complexes, I guess that's the flip side of this research, is that very often it generates a structure that's at least as complex and uh, unwe unwieldy as the original data set that you're looking at. Um, so there's more work that needs to go, uh, go in, uh, into simplifying these structures and really using them for analysis. Um, but along those lines, uh, some work that, that I did with Attila Julasi 
two years ago, actually starting from four years ago, but actually resulting in real work two years ago, um, involved uh, using um, these topological data structures, using the morse vale uh, complex to analyze battery materials. Um, and here, you could do this off of raw atom geometry and knowledge of where the bonds are, but that doesn't really tell you um, where things can go, what, uh, uh, whether or not you can fit an atom through a structure based on what we, something we call persistence, which is sort of the difference between a minimum and maximum level uh, within a Morse male uh, complex cell. Um, and using this notion of persistence and the Morse male complex, we were actually able to not just look at really simple structures like this, but actually expand it to full um, computational data sets that they couldn't really analyze this way before. So all of a sudden, they could look at this data set, um, the, the scientists we were working with, they could look at this data set and find out where ions would go through this big simulated battery material. Um, without actually having to run a molecular dynamic simulation for these ions, which would be prohibitive just because of the, the time scales that are required. Um, so I think that was a success story for using topology for actual scientific data analysis. And this was a, a paper um, in IEEE BIS 15, if anyone's interested in this. So today, uh, I guess I knocked off 15 minutes there, but we're going to talk about vector and tensor fields. Uh, so this will be the final uh, lecture in spatial visualization. Let's see, vectors and tensors. Oh, let's go back to the beginning. There we go. This so, is a demonstration um, the first part of this talk character. is really talking about vector field or flow visualization. Uh, going back to our notion of fields, we can have um, scalar fields, which are really just a single value at each grid point. And again, we have these uh, scattered uniform rectilinear structured or unstructured grids. Um, and a, a vector field is basically the same idea, except you have a vector at each point uh, in your grid. And here's an example with structured data and with unstructured point data. This is a demonstration um, of why our So test. more formally, whereas a scalar field is some mapping from uh, Euclidean space to real numbers, a vector field is a, map, a mapping from Euclidean space to some Rm, uh, but it's not a multi-field. The idea is that for a, a vector field, these, these are really coordinates. They, they have some relationship to the spatial grid or some other quantity that's inherently spatial uh, in some way. Um, that's, I guess, more the case for tensors. But the idea is that it's still, it, it's the, the multiple components of the vector are still spatial. Whereas for multi-field, they're really non-spatial. They re represent different attributes, different phenomena entirely. Um, so usually m equals n, but not always. Um, and again, the vector is the element of the field here. So most of the time, the vector field can be represented continuously as an ODE um, using you know, this differential equation. And when you're moving across it, you're really interested in what happens as you go from one point to another in the, in the data set. So originally, if you're talking about scalar fields, we're interested in interpolating values uh, going from discrete to continuous, whereas in vector fields, we're really interested in integrating values. Uh, so kind of moving along in space along the, the uh, direction of the vector uh, using certain criteria, like does the reference frame move with us? What's our time step? Things like this. So vector field visualization, or more commonly flow visualization, is about how we select and show these trajectories in your, in your field. Uh, and there are lots of applications of this. I'm not going to go over this slide because the pictures are more interesting. Uh, but basically, I'd say the, the, the big phenomena you're interested in are sort of um, flow uh, quantities, for example. Um, uh, uh, the motion of fluids, uh, looking at boundary conditions, comparing that with temperature and pressure, uh, or sort of um, summary, summary um, uh, heuristics like vorticity, um, and this is really about the, the field of fluid dynamics. Uh, I, I, I'd say that's the main source of vector field data in spatial visualization. So why do we care about this at all? Um, really. The, uh, the reason we're doing a lot of these simulations is because of this sort of thing, this sort of experimental setup uh, is pretty expensive. Um, so in, I'd say, 
going back to the early days of aeronautics, uh, people would do wind tunnel experiments uh, and they would uh, sort of create smoke screens and look at what happened to the smoke as an aircraft through, uh, flew through it. And in some cases they would have really interesting patterns like these smoke angels, um, or in another case you'd have this big vortex uh, that happens uh, when a plane lifts off. And these at first glance look pretty interesting, but it doesn't look like you'd actually be able to use this to design an aircraft. Um, but when you look at an aircraft in a wind tunnel, you see very quickly that vortices are bad. Vortices represent places where there is drag on a section of the aircraft, uh, where the curvature uh, of the surface is high, and it's causing the scalar field around it, or really the vector field around it, the field in any case around it, to, um, to warp very, very dramatically in a relatively small region of space. Uh, so you can see how, you can already sort of have this intuitive understanding of how this relates to topology. Uh, regions of high gradient change, um, uh, high persistence, uh, they, uh, they all relate very, very uh, closely to what happens to areas on the surface and areas in the field close to the surface. Um, so so um, in a more automotive design, you had similar analogies where they would put little wool tufts on the surface of cars and they would check to see how much they moved when, uh, when you drove the car at high speeds. Um, so uh, if you, here you have like a, uh, an early Lamborghini uh, wool tuft experiment. Uh, and is a demonstration uh, nowadays you can test. actually see, do wind tunnel, you, you can also do wind tunnel simulations um, it, uh, that, that more or less show, show the same thing. But it's again very tedious to do wind tunnel uh, simulations and you don't necessarily find out the exact hot spots um, on the vehicle where the, uh, where the problems can be. And you also have to have the vehicle or scale model of the vehicle when you're doing this. Uh, and in a lot of cases, you want to actually create the scale model, the model or the computational model before you actually uh, design or mass produce the vehicle. So really, the, the computational uh, fluid dynamics codes give you a tool for doing this. So this is one last image. This is a scale model um, of uh, I believe in F yeah, F-18 in a water tunnel, uh, and they were able to carefully design this experiment, uh, carefully design the um, properties of the fluid that this was immersed in to make it mimic um, what air at high altitude uh, and with a, an aircraft traveling this close to the speed of satellite. Like. Um, and this was, again, uh, very, uh, very tedious, very uh, time consuming to generate. Uh, but they were able to do this using physical scale models. Um, and this turns us to why we do this on the computer. It, it really not, not having to take the, the time or design a scale model before you actually run some of these experiments. So fluid dy dynamics is a huge self-encapsulated field in itself. Um, I don't really have time to go over most of it in these, in these slides, but I created one slide that tries to summarize most of it based on uh, the first chapter of this book and Wikipedia. Um, so generally, uh, we're trying to model the Navier-Stokes equations, which is a very complicated set of PDEs that model how fluids behave at various time and space scales. Um, and here's just one sample, one excerpt of the Navier-Stokes equations uh, pertaining to compressible fluids. Um, and the idea is that this is going to decompose um, that this is going to turn an arbitrary field into something um, that we can represent um, in, in terms of um, mostly um, ordinary differential equations. Um, so the, 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 P, the ODEs we're talking about here uh, are really the, um, looking at the time derivatives. So if, for example, for sl steady flow, uh, for steady flow um, you, uh, you have this uh, d rho dt derivative um, over time. Um, and a steady flow would be um, would be uh, so, something that more or less moves to an animation here. No, I do not have an, an animation here. It, it more or less moves. Um, uh, it, 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 the, the, the vector field won't change as the flow keeps on moving. Whereas an unsteady flow, uh, the characteristic of the vector field will actually change from time step to time, to time step. So in a steady flow, if you have a particle that's kind of moving through the flow, it will keep on moving in the same direction, 
Um, whereas in an unsteady flow, it would actually veer off this course and go to any, uh, any cast. number of sources and sinks. Um, related to this, um, you have this concept of uh, laminar or turbulent flows. Laminar is more like kind of sheet-like, everything moves in parallel, and uh, turbulent has a lot, of, a lot of critical points, a lot of vortices, sources, and sinks. Um, and then finally, there is the Reynolds number, which is a measure of turbulence. So it's the, uh, the ratio of the inertial forces, so how fast things are moving, to the viscous forces. So how, um, how I, I guess, constrictive your, your fluid would be, how test. much it would uh, keep every particle intact. Uh, so that, that tries to summarize all fluid dynamics in one slide, probably unsuccessfully. Uh, but uh, here is the seminal text on fluid mechanics if anyone wants to go into detail. Um, needless to say, we get a lot of data sets uh, like this in visualization from fields such as automotive design, um, uh, meteorology, uh, climatology, um, uh, 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 let's see, uh, um, uh, is a demonstration uh, oceanography, of the, the oil spill tra trajectory data sets, and of course a lot of military applications involving, involving projectiles. And really any time a vehicle is involved or you have a moving fluid or something moving through a fluid. Um, it, with uh, the visualization tool Nsight and, uh, and codes like Fun3D, you see a lot of simulations that are not incredibly huge, but, give, but simulate a wide variety of um, a phenomena uh, around auto bodies. Um, this is a so demonstration there, yeah, of there's, there are codes like um, like Star CCM, like uh, Fun 3D, like RANS, um, and in aerospace, uh, I mean, same same sort of thing. Except instead of looking at um, automotive, um, like at autos, you're looking at um, at vector fields around something like a scramjet. Um, uh, as it's moving through, uh, moving through the atmosphere. Um, so now we're actually going to talk about flow visualization itself. So before we were really talking about the sources of data and where these vector fields come from. They come from, I would say, by and large, finite elements codes, but, but not exclusively, uh, that give you a vector field that are applied to some sort of, um, some sort of um, uh, data set like this. So um, quick show of hands, does anyone remember to find that elements codes are mostly struct are structured or unstructured data with respect to geometry? This is a demonstration uh, of why yes. yes, yes, that's right. Yeah, so there are a, a bunch of triangles and there's no regular or rectilinear grid in space. Uh, so that's unstructured geometry, yeah. So, um, how do we do flow visualization? Well, there are, I would say, five broad categories. Uh, there are these sort of characteristic curves of the vector field, which are, I'd say, the most popular and best known, um, both from a theoretical and practical perspective. Then you have uh, sort of the texture-based methods. You have uh, geometry-based methods, yes, like hedgehogs. Um, and then you have cast. sort of heuristic methods, uh, like gradient magnitude, Laplacian's uh, finite time of the Avanov exponent. Um, and then you have physically based uh, methods that are not really vector field visualization, but pertain to predominantly flow or vector field data sets. So I think of uh, things like Schlieren imaging or virtual rheoscopic fluids, uh, papers that are actually really good, but have almost no sites for some reason. Um, so where? Uh, um, so flow can happen in 2D, um, on surfaces that are embedded in 3D, and you can have flow in 3D space itself, uh, in, the, in the fluid in three, in three dimensions. So the uh, first one we'll look at are the characteristic curves of a vector field. Um, and these are streamlines, pathlines, streak lines, and timelines. Um, probably the, the best known of these would be streamlines and pathlines. Uh, streamlines uh, basically are, are move um, tangent to the vector field at each point for a fixed time, and pathlines are the same thing but moving it's over time. So as your vector field test. changes, your path will end up changing with it. Um, streak lines are related. They're basically um, at, at, at tracing a die from, um, from a fixed position and seeing where it goes. Um, in the vector field, and then timelines are sort of a burst of particles over time and seeing where they spread out over somewhat discrete uh, elapsed intervals of time. And these will make a little bit more sense um, as I'll show a few examples. Uh, 
So here we have streamlines at the top that are more or less stay, uh, stay tangent to the cast. vector field, path lines that move with the vector field, streak lines that um, sort of uh, evolve over time, uh, and then timelines that are bursts in time, uh, like this. Um, so as time moves on, uh, let's see, do, uh, there we go. You can sort of see what happens to raw particle data sets without, um, uh, with, without streamlines or, uh, or path lines. And here's a comparison of streamlines and path lines. On the left, on the left you have streamlines, and on the right you have path lines. Again, they're, they're really showing the same phenomena in a sense. It's just that um, uh, path lines are uh, changing the reference frame at each iteration, whereas streamlines are always staying tangent to, uh, to the vector field. Um, so it, in a sense, path lines are moving with the flow, and, stream, and streamlines are just sort of showing the innate vector field without actually moving with respect to it. Um, so streamlines are good for illustrating um, a, a steady flow where the, the vector field doesn't really change over time. Path lines are what, what you would want to show if you sort of moved particles along um, over time in an unsteady flow where the vector field changes. Um, yeah, so that, that more or less illustrates the same thing. So uh, again, streamlines are really designed for steady flow fields, and path lines are designed for more for unsteady flow. Um, Timelines. Uh, probably this would be better to illustrate with the with, um, the uh, stream and time surfaces video. But the idea is that your vector field is more or less here, and you're starting from a seed over here, and the timelines are illustrated by. Um, there's sort of this burst of particles over here. So these yellow dots each represent a timeline. Um, and these will spread out over the data set um, as you generate more points. Um, and it, it's almost this kind of like an on-off way of visualizing test. particles using these characteristic curves. Um, and streak lines are, are sort of the, op the opposite. It's sort of um, bursts over time, they're sort of interleaved bursts over space. You can see this is more or less what it looks like. Um, now, in a steady vector field, so with, with steady flow, if the vector field doesn't change over time, streamlines, path lines, and streak lines are all the same thing. They would look identical. Um, and if you have an unsteady vector field, then they will all be different. Uh, timelines are something completely different. There doesn't really, there's, there's no sense in having timelines if you have a steady vector field because it doesn't change over time. You have one burst and nothing changes. Um, so those are the, the four characters, characteristic curves of, of the vector field. Um, so integration techniques. So I mentioned that in a scalar field, we're interested in how we interpolate. And in a vector field, we're interested in how we integrate. Um, and there are two, I guess, two general ways we can do this. Um, this one is the Euler method. Um, you know, basically what we're doing is we are, um, we are integrating over this um, ordinary differential equation over time. Uh, and you can use this using fixed step size in a linear method like Euler. Or you can integrate over, um, you, you can use a higher order method that sort of looks in advance over time and space and um, uses some regression type technique to, uh, to integrate in a, uh, in a higher order method. So uh, Runge Kata 2 is an alternative to Euler. And in practice, Runge Kata 4, this fourth order um, Runge Kata, uh, ends up being what everyone uses or, what, or it's the gold standard for, um, for uh, integration of these, character these characteristic uh, 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 um, curves uh, of the vector field. Um, so this will kind of compares what first order Euler versus uh, fourth order Rakakata does. Uh, you can see um, if you take really large step sizes of Euler, it really veers far out of the vector field very quickly. Um, I mean, ideally you want to stay in the circle. Uh, the, the circle is the ground truth of what the vector field is doing here. And you can see with Euler, you're, you're going to veer, uh, you're, you're going to have numerical issues almost from the first instant. Uh, with uh, uh, second order Rangakata, you're a little bit better. Um, and with fourth order Rangakata, um, you, uh, you basically stay on, uh, on target. You're, you're following the path, the, the trace of the circle. Uh, and this is for a simple streamline and a steady flow example. Um, it, in conclusion, 
I'm actually this came from Hong Shen's slides, but I think in conclusion, the whole community likes Rungakata 4. So if you're doing any sort of streamlined integration, you end up wanting to use Rungakata 4. The only ex exceptions to that I could think of would be if you really were shooting off lots and lots of short streamlines or, uh, or, or path lines, and if you only really cared about what happens over a comparatively short distance, and you had lots and lots of them, and uh, you were paralyzing this in, in a very specific way. But otherwise, if you care about this what the vector field actually looks like, uh, Rungakata is the way to go. Um, so you also have this, have this question not of how you integrate it, that integration is, is pretty straightforward. Um, if you care about length um, and accuracy, Rungakata. But um, in, there's also this question of where do you place your seed to begin with? Where do you actually start integrating? Um, and th this was a subject of a lot of research in the late 90s and early 2000s. Um, and you have two problems here. One is that is um, it, it, of it, it's computationally costly to, um, to shoot off a lot of streamlines or path lines uh, if you don't know where to put them. But it's also a lot of clutter. Even if you do succeed in computing all of them, you have this filtering problem where it's going to look like a big garbled mess unless you show the interesting, um, the interesting characteristic curves. Um, so you have to have the right number of seeds at the right places. Um, so originally, people would start by just placing seeds in a regular grid. But what's interesting is that even for fairly homogeneous, uh, smooth vector fields, if you use a regular grid, you would end up with these odd striation artifacts like the image on the left, where you would you have weird bundles and a lot of irregular placement of these characteristic curves, despite the fact that you had a very regular placement of the initial seeds. And ideally, you'd want something on the right uh, that is more or less equidistantly spaced um, uh, non-biased um, characteristic curves. Um, so that image on the right was, is, is the seminal uh, Turk and Banks paper from 1996. Uh, and there are uh, other papers, uh, even going as late as 2009, that were really trying to answer the question, how do we effectively uh, sample um, seed points for streamlined or pathline or streamlined um, integration? Um, the Turk and Banks paper, I'll just go over this really quickly. Um, its basic idea is to uh, sort of do a, maybe a progressive approach, where you start off with very, very short streamlines, um, and this you're able to uh, look at how far they go and eliminate the ones that aren't very interesting right off the bat. And for the ones that remain, you apply a series of these sort of elementary operations, like combining um, them together if they're too similar, so deleting them, creating new ones, um, and then uh, you're able to uh, also lengthen and shorten them if you think they're interesting. Um, and a, a lot of the, uh, uh, the techniques that they would use for doing this are very similar to image processing. Um, even edge detection this techniques. Is a demonstration of um, so here's some. Uh, so so uh, I guess going back to the image processing analogy, they would sort of look at the resulting character, characteristic curves that are rendered, and they would use these as heuristics for determining: um, Do we need to have more? Do we need to add or remove stream, uh, these streamlets? Um, and and how do you place new ones? So that's the the essence of the um, the, the Turk and Banks paper. I'd say it's probably very similar to maybe procedural noise techniques and um, uh, to a certain extent edge detection, edge detection techniques coming out of the image processing literature of the time. Um, it's still more or less the gold standard for what to do. In practice, not a lot of people actually implement this from what I've seen. Very often they'll just use re uh, regular gridding um, and uh, they'll maybe uh, use some procedural noise techs or uh, there are actually some implementations uh, for LIC that are used in, uh, in streamlined placement, at least in 2D. Um, but the general idea of having this sort of low-pass, um, nicely spaced uh, uh, texture that you're using to guide where to put your actual samples, uh, this, uh, I think this is something that caught on, that you still see it in, a, in a lot of the, seed, the, the seeding literature. And in 3D, um, it's, uh, it's a lot harder to do this because you actually have to generate a big volume data set to be the equivalent of your 2D um, um, guiding field. 
Uh, so evenly spaced um, uh, streamlines yes, make a lot less sense in 3D. Um, if you start in the uniform grid, it's like you again have the same problem, but even worse in three dimensions. But what's interesting is a lot of the, the people who started doing topological analysis and finding critical points of scalar fields uh, apply basically the same principles to vector fields and use these critical points and knowledge of the topology to be able to seed three-dimensional space. And you don't need a very good topological model of what happens in 3D. In fact, you don't even need a topological graph That's at all. You just need knowledge of where the critical case. points are. And that already gives you a pretty good idea of where to see it in three dimensions. So Timo Weinkauf had a paper in 2003 that more or less did this. And I'd say that's kind of state of the art for placement in 3D. Um, let's see, there's some image, uh, there, there's some image space techniques uh, where you, um, you look at uh, a projected image and sort of place uh, seeds based on just what you've rendered out in, in, in 2D. Um, I'm not going to go into, into those too much. Uh, and then you have these streamlined bundling techniques, which are less about how you place seeds in the first place, but uh, computing all of them and then removing um, the, the, the streamlines that you don't care about. So it's mostly about um, using the interesting streamlines to segment the data set, uh, not really using topology to begin with, but uh, ending up with something a lot like what you'd see from a Lagrangian coherence structure in the, in the topological analysis that I'll, I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, so uh, you were able to, so they had, uh, you all had a technique for doing this in 2D, and the same principle applies in three dimensions. In fact, there's a lot of similarity between these techniques and the um, InfoViz graph clustering algorithms. Um, the, the idea is you want to build a tree that sort of represents a hierarchy of the interesting or similar streamlines and use that to, to prune or to cluster um, uh, the, uh, your entire set of streamlines. Um, there's another paper that uh, more or less uh, looks at lot how you illuminate case. streamlines and uses uh, lighting differences to uh, get not just have better depth cues, but to actually uh, visualize the whole data set. Uh, and it's sort of like a focus context technique where you're only interested in, in certain regions and you have, uh, you have a more diffuse illumination or completely black illumination outside of regions where the streamlines do something interesting. Um, and there was a, a SIGGRAPH paper uh, in 2013 about opacity optimization. So here you end up rendering a whole bunch of streamlines and you're interested in using non-photorealistic rendering techniques to um, make the ones you don't care about mostly transparent and accentuate the boundaries of the streamlines you do care about. Um, and they used a combination of, um, uh, of uh, sort of uh, depth peeling techniques and um, and NPR techniques to accentuate edges, especially when you have streamlines that overlap one another. Um, and they came up with some, some great images. They were able to, to render, I think, on the order of millions of streamlines, which is a lot of streamlines, um, by, and, and just brute force rendered using this technique, and it looked great, and it was fast. Um, so then you have, once you get away from actual characteristic curves, what if you combine, if you merge these curves together, you end up having a surface a lot of the time. Uh, in fact, that's, you end up having a surface more or less all of the time. Uh, so Matthias Hummel in 2010 yes, came up with a technique for extracting and then rendering these, um, these characteristic uh, stream surfaces, which are really just collections of stream lines. Um, and you end up with these great images like, like the one in the upper right. Um, so that, I'd say this is newer research, but it's, and it's not really available in a lot of the packages like Fun3D, let alone Pair of or Visit, um, but it's still, um, I'd say, very compelling as a technique. When you look at this, it really shows things that you'd actually start to see in a wind tunnel. Uh, as opposed to sort of massless, uh, unidimensional um, uh, or one-dimensional curves that happen to be going through three-dimensional space. Um, and the, the principle of how to generate a stream surface or a stream surface is actually very similar to how you generate seeds for a stream line or, or a path line. The only difference is that all of a sudden here you have a line of seed points 
and you're interested in creating the surface that results from that seed line. This is a demonstration um, this is, of wire I'd say, test. Much better explained through this video. So just to give you an idea, these bursts of color over time, those are timelines. And this transparent surface that you see, that's a streak surface. So that's one interesting thing about, about using surfaces is that if you just use streamlines, you'd be able to look at maybe one phenomenon, like streamlines or path lines at a time. Whereas if you use a surface, you actually can look at both timelines and streak lines at the same time. Wirecast. So this is a time surface, which is sort of the equivalent of timelines. Although I don't really see the bursts. Maybe they miss, maybe they actually got that wrong. Maybe, uh, Hmm. Uh, that's interesting. This is a demonstration of Wirecast. is a demonstration of Wirecast. Oh, okay. There we go. Yeah, that was very strange. So, can you explain again what that one's showing? I'm looking at it and you say it's time surfaces. Yeah, I'm time surfaces is what the video time. says, but I'm, I'm actually trying to figure that, figure that out too. I think what's going on here is they have a color map of the surface, and the color represents time. This so it's starting out with red, and it's wire evolving cast. towards green. So that's probably what they're showing here. So what does our evolution in time represent if color is time? That is a good question. Oh, so that would be, so if you had a particle in space, and it was somewhere, um, it started off at the C point, the, I guess the color over time would be more like how long the particle has been in the system. That makes sense. The color is how long it's been in there. This is a demonstration of Wirecast. Which let's, is where it's going. Let's go take a look at this. Um, so let's take a look at the, uh, the original example. So it starts off green, and then as time evolves, it, it turns towards red. Um, does, does that, that kind of make sense? And I think the next video is showing, showing something very similar, except you don't have these bursts. So it's a continuous um, a evolution of time. Of wire cast. Um, but th I think it's the same phenomenon uh, underneath the hood. So green is early and red is late. And you could also look at the underlying surface geometry as a mesh. Um, I think this is more interesting in terms of how you render it and how they generated it. The technique is more or less generating these characteristic curves and then stitching it together using an algorithm that was actually a little bit like the advanced front algorithm um, that I presented uh, in la the last lecture. Um, so, I'd say in practice, these are probably not used in this as many production of um, simulations as you'd like. I'd say these are more along the lines of what you could do. Most of the production tools out there, like, um, like Ensight, would have uh, streamlines and street lines and path lines and timelines, and they visualize them in 3D as a bunch of um, curves with some, some thickness. Um, and this is probably something that is a little further out, um, 
maybe maybe the uh, the fun 3D guys or the yes. inside guys would be interested in generating this as an analysis from either the simulation side or or the uh, the inside rendering side. But yeah, good question. Um, the last time I've seen research on on this was sort of 2013. Um, it, there was a I think some a paper in uh, Pacificas that was uh, diving into this. Uh, so Christoph Garth's group and Xavier Trakosha's group uh, at Kaiser Slaughter and Purdue, they're still working on this quite a bit. Um, but yeah, yes. I, there, there is always this question. I'd say there's always a good five to ten year delay between a research technique coming out and it actually getting rolled into production in some way, shape, or form, depending on how urgent it is. Um, let's see. Let's go back to no wait, that's the old one. Vectors and tensors. Here we go. So um, we just talked about the characteristic curve-based techniques. Now let's talk about texture-based based techniques. Um, the idea here is that it's really a 2D technique, and you want to start with some addition, some original texture that's either um, it's either noise or some set of dots or even just a black rectangle, and you want to convolve it with a vector field in a way that gives you an interesting pattern and shows off the vector field. And the first of these techniques was something from uh, Jacqueline Wick uh, in SIGGRAPH 91 called spot noise, and the idea here is you start up with a small little intensity function, like a Gaussian or a spot, and you um, convolve, and, and then you sort of convolve it over the domain, You you um, infect the, it over the vector field a few times, and you end up smearing it over the vector field in certain ways, and you get images kind of like this. Um, that said, if you took a small, uh, enough small spots and you ran this technique over and over and over again, you could get some really nice images like this one. I still think this looks better than a lot of the... Uh, demonstration of Wirecast. The, um, the lick uh, results if we can ever get it to load. Yeah, here we go. Uh, yeah. But you can see, see there's still some problems here. There's a lot of detail in certain regions of the, of the vector field, and a lot, not a lot of detail in other regions. And you'd like to have it, um, I guess, more um, uniformly spaced. Here we go. And there are also the areas that you care about, the vortices, um, that really just warble a lot and you really have a bad idea of what's going on close to the areas of topological interest. So in 1993, um, Cabr uh, uh, Brian Cabral and his advisor came up with uh, a technique called line integral convolution. And this is probably the seminal image-based flow viz technique um, that's used in most uh, implementations today. So if you go into Paraview or Insight, um, there's some line integral convolution solution you can use. Um, some of the better work that I've seen was not actually doing uh, lick in 3D, but it was actually doing it on, in 2D on surfaces and sort of using it kind of as a virtual equivalent of the wool tufts that we had on the Lamborghini a few slides ago. Um, so this is something where spot noise wouldn't really cut it, but, but Lick does. So compared to spot noise, which is really just about creating an image with a single little Gaussian blur or a few of them, Lick is really a, a whole global visualization technique. Um, it starts out with a texture, a noise texture, uh, that you then convolve around the vector, data, uh, the vector field. Um, and you keep on doing this, you smear it out over and over again until you end up having um, uh, more or less an image like this. Um, so uh, again, this, this convolution operation gets done repeatedly. While you're doing it, you're integrating uh, using Rangakata or, or, or uh, Euler, well, hopefully Rangakata, very similarly to what you do for, um, for a characteristic curve, except what you're doing, um, you're not uh, trying to integrate vertices of that curve, you're integrating cells of your two-dimensional field. So it looks more like this. Um, your vector field is the vector here, 
um, that would correspond to the streamline, the characteristic curve there, um, but instead you have this input texture, the noise texture, and then uh, and, and you're really sort of sampling the noise, sampling that texture um, as that this convolution happens. Uh, so if you do this for one time step, so this is sort of an early step in the integration, and you had a noise texture, it still more or less looks like a noise texture, but with uh, 10 iterations, it already starts to look like a decent um, evolution of the vector field, and here's 25 iterations, and here's 50 iterations. So you can sort of see how the longer you do this, it is computationally costly, but you get better and better approximations of at least what an unsteady, uh, I'm sorry, what a steady flow would look like. Um, and here's 100. Um, so it, interestingly enough, this is just a black and white technique, but you can also use um, color to represent another, another quantity, like maybe a scalar field quantity or, um, or velocity magnitude. Um, so here's, uh, uh, see, here's using velocity magnitude to color, uh, kind of using a heat map. This is um, a and you can extend this to 3D test. flows also. Um, it's very easy to do this conceptually, it's just very computationally costly, and it's very tough to volume render. So um, I guess probably the, the best solution I've seen is some work from Boshi Lee in 2003 I called Chameleon um, that sort of created transfer functions that would chop out most of the noisy, uninteresting regions of 3D Lick. Um, there are better techniques out there, but in practice, people use Lick for 2D and not so much for 3D. Uh, there's um, a, an extension of Lick to handle unsteady flows. So it turns out that if you just use Lick, uh, the basic algorithm, um, it works great for steady flows when the vector field doesn't change, but when the vector field does change, you end up having these pretty horrible smeary artifacts. So there was a, uh, you had to have sort of a correction to the algorithm to, to handle this. Um, and the way they do this is they end up integrating over several time steps of the, under, the unsteady vector field, not just averaging them out, but actually integrating over time as, as, as well as space. Um, and when you do this, you're able to represent unsteady, unsteady flow. So there's this work uh, also by Goshi Lee um, in flow charts, which uh, basically handle all sorts of unsteady flows over vector fields of aircraft and automotive bodies. Um, last thing I'll mention is image-based flow visualization, which is another te uh, technique by uh, Jacqueline Wick. Um, and it's, I'd say, in a, in a sense, this is kind of like better spot noise. Uh, it's been adopted in some commercial software packages. I think Bun3D actually has an, an IBFB implementation, uh, as well as a Lick implementation. So sometimes you'll end up seeing um, uh, flow visualizations uh, that, that use IBFV, and you can't really tell if it's that or Lick, um, but it's, it's worth mentioning both of these techniques. Um, so here's this, uh, this Chameleon paper that I was talking about before, uh, doing volumetric Lick, uh, and you can see it's, um, it's sort of tough to, to get the same sort of results you want out of two-dimensional Lick, but if you're careful with how you apply your transfer function, you can get something that looks almost Lick-like, uh, by segmenting it out and, uh, and, and uh, showing, uh, showing the gradients, showing more surface-like features. Uh, and th this is really a combination of volume rendering and, uh, um, and, uh, uh, and uh, flow, flow visualization using Lick. So um, I talked about, I guess, the, the two most common flow visualization techniques. Now I'll talk about, um, in I guess, the most common uh, actually integrating flow visualization techniques. Now we'll talk about the more naive techniques um, that are, I guess, more common in two dimensions. So arrow plots, um, you see these a lot in two-dimensional meteorology, climatology, any sort of GIS visualization with the vector field. Um, they make a lot of sense there. It's, a, it, it's kind of obvious how this works in 2D. Uh, the only downside is that they really are tied to the grid and uh, you don't necessarily get a sense of where the, the sources and sinks are in all cases. This um, is a demonstration of And wire you're cast. also limited to, to what you can show with just aeroglyphs that all look the same. So some people uh, came up early on with the idea of using thicker arrows uh, for, uh, to represent magnitude. Um, and uh, um, Mike Kirby actually had an extension of this, te this technique. In fact, this is sort of a combination of uh, the, the streamlined pl uh, placement ideas with lip visualization techniques. 
and he used this to visualize um, uh, uh, to, to visualize flow past a cylinder uh, in two dimensions in, in the late nineties. Um, so the, I, I would say this is about as as far as the glyph visualization techniques have gotten. Um, for, for the most part, people have moved away from glyphs after, uh, after the late 90s. Um, you still see them in sort of more infoviz and GIS applications, but not so much in spatial visualization. And this is really why. I mean, this is what, what glyphs look like for a relatively small, uh, small grid in 3D. Um, and anytime you have something much larger, you really need to go into showing straight lines, or showing straight surfaces or uh, looking at a surface and looking at LIC or IBFB on that surface. So really, glyphs um, are tough to make work in three-dimensional settings. Um, so of course the advantages are, are that they're simple, um, but the disadvantages are that they, uh, they clutter very quickly and uh, you have occlusion problems, so they're, they're really not well designed for 3D. So the next uh, set of techniques for flow viz that are worth mentioning are sort of the direct and heuristic approaches. Um, and there are simple things like gradient magnitude uh, and uh, using volume rendering of gradient magnitude. And I, I'd say these are so, in a sense, brain dead that you, you see this all, all the time. And it actually can be a very good visualization for what a lot of domain scientists want to see. Uh, a lot of the time you just do want to see where the, the gradient of your vector field is high and that's good enough to sort of convey, if not sources and sinks of your vector field, then at least where the interesting spots this happen. Um, so it's, it's kind of like a very coarse topological classification if you just look at gradient magnitude. Um, and then there's something that's even better than gradient magnitude called finite time Lyapunov exponent. Um, so, F or FTLE. And what this is really trying to do is it's trying to create a scalar field that tells you how far particles have advected. Um, so how far trajectories diverge um, in a flow field. Uh, and this, uh, when you do this sort of analysis, you end up with a scalar field that tells you kind of the, the inherent topological structures in your vector, in your vector field, the so-called Lagrangian coherent structures. Um, so, it sounds like a complicated technique, but it's really just um, uh, just a uh, it involves seeding a bunch of particles, sending them through your vector field, um, uh, and and summing up how far the particles have moved, and uh, taking a log to correct that. And you end up once you've done that, you end up with a scalar field, and you're able to you to do any sort of volume visualization you want from that. And I think actually this is some of the most effective vector field visualization I've seen, um, assuming the, the video will play. So you end up with, with visualizations kind of like this, where um, I guess uh, red would be the source and blue would be, no, I'm sorry, blue would be the, no, red would be the source and blue would be the sink this is a demonstration uh, in, in of this LCS test. visualization. And this again is just showing the uh, FTLE field, which is a measure of how far particles have spread apart over the course of the simulation uh, when they're affected through the vector field. Let's see. And the last thing I'll mention are, again, more volume visualization than flow visualization, but they only really make, this, make sense in the context of flow visualization um, uh, or flow test. data sets. Um, so one of these is virtual rheoscopic fluids. Um, there were actually two papers uh, that came out roughly at the same time. Uh, neither of them are well remembered, unfortunately, but the co concept is dead simple and um, very, very analogous to what actual scientists would use in the field if they had physical data sets on which to test. So the idea of VRFs is you have a bunch of uh, particles that show, that reflect light in certain orientations but not in others, and depending on how they get scattered and dispersed through a flow field, they're going to reflect in certain ways more than others. Uh, so for example, if you have kind of striated data sets or data sets where current would force all the particles to reflect in one way, uh, like in the cylinder, it's a very good technique there. Um, in other cases, it's, uh, it's, uh, you have uh, data sets that are more 
I guess, a little bit more scattered. But the idea is that you would um, be able to compare this with something you'd actually run from experiment. Um, so another technique is uh, Schlieren imaging, which is, I think, more of like a contrast manipulation technique from uh, actual imagery. Um, this, uh, so Carson, Carson Brownlee had a paper in Pacific Biz 2010, more or less doing this and rendering uh, uh, computational data sets in the same, uh, fluid data sets in the same way that real world smoke and I guess high, high velocity, low density this fluids would be visualized using Schlieren or Shadowgraph techniques. Um, the idea here, um, the, the idea of Schlieren imaging is that instead of just having a camera that's photographing the effect, you have this knife edge that um, kind of uh, causes a lot of the scattered light, um, the, the in-scattered light from, this, uh, from the, uh, the fluid as it's hitting the camera to otherwise just be cut off. So you end up having these small scale banding um, effects that only hit your eye, and a, that only hit the, the knife edge um, sort of maybe every, um, Oh, I'm not sure how, how much this would be in photons, but um, it's sort of like a way of uh, artificially bumping up the contrast um, in, uh, in, when you're photographing um, a moving flame or moving fluid. Um, and th again, the, uh, uh, the visualization technique is sort of a computational equivalent to that, that artificially bumps up the contrast of, um, of certain densities and not of others. So that, that's, I'd say, flow um, in, in a nutshell. That's, uh, those are the, the techniques, by and large, I can think of for handling vector fields. Um, there are some other techniques, um, actually I didn't show in some slides, involving topology. Um, let's see if I can actually show this. Uh, um, let's see, did I actually know? Yeah, here we go, yeah. I took this out of the slide set, but I, I really should show it. Um, so this is some work from Josh this Levine and Harsh Badia in 2012 that's sort of a topological decomposition of, the vector, of a vector field similar to what you'd have uh, from topological analysis of scalar fields. And what's interesting about this line of work is it, it sort of lets you decompose your vector field into areas of like interest into the uh, uh, into this, the so-called stable manifolds. Um, and it, it, it's almost a, a more uh, effective way of encapsulating what's going on in a this large entropic a uh, vector test. field than what you would get out of character, characteristic curves or uh, streamlined bundling or techni techniques like that. It might actually have similar results to streamlined bundling, but, um, but this is, I, I'd say, an example of where topological analysis actually makes sense. Um, where you can see you end up having uh, vast swaths of ocean that are more or less becalmed, and then you have other regions where there's a lot of entropy. And it would be very tough to show this just by using streamlines, for example. This is a demonstration of Wirecast. Okay, let's go back to, let's go back to the main slide deck. So now we're going to conclude um, the spatial vis lectures with tensor field visualization. And tensor fields are, in a lot of ways, a, a, they're a lot like vector fields. Uh, you have some quantity, uh, some mapping from uh, Euclidean space to, uh, to a set of tuples. But here, instead of the set of tuples being a vector that re uh, reflects some spatial dimension, it's really a matrix that represents usually um, space and then something else, or uh, an additional uh, spatial reference frame. And sometimes in the case of um, uh, like a DTI data set, uh, it, it represents the way things can flow in and out that have been measured in a certain way. In the cases of stress tensors, it's really how a material can, can move with respect to one axis or another. Uh, so you have a tensor that sort of represents degrees of freedom but there's no, it, it's maybe a little bit more abstract than what you would have from a vector field, where a vector field really pertains to what's going on at this point in space with respect to usually the, dimension, the dimensionality of your, your original data set. Um, so uh, again, tensor is sort of like the matrix equivalent of, um, of a vector. 
um, for, uh, and you'd represent this as usually this, this tuple um, of, of uh, vector chemist. quantities, uh, x1 to xn. Um, and uh, the typical tensors that we have in visualization are either diffusion temp tensors for medical imaging or um, tensors from material simulations. For example, conductivity, dielectrics, magnetic, magnetic permittivity, or stress tensors. Um, so I, I, these tend to come out of the bioengineering um, and uh, biomechanical engineering uh, fields. And here's sort of an illustration of what a symmetric second order tensor looks like. Um, so you're, you have uh, these sort of uh, eigenvalues, or I'm sorry, eigenvectors E1 and E2, and uh, you end up uh, projecting it in a certain way when you actually uh, want to visualize it or flatten it or diagonalize it. Um, so a lot of the time, uh, you, it will natively look like this where you, you'll have the two eigenvectors, but you'll actually see some projected version of it, be it an ellipsoid or just a flattened this disk or, or uh, uh, an uh, ellipse on the screen. Um, so there are, there are lots of ways you can actually do this, but you end up having very often to, to lose something in translation. Um, so applications, we mentioned uh, DTI and, uh, and sort of uh, biomechanical engineering applications, but really there, there are applications in geology, astrophysics, continu continuum mechanics. Uh, uh, in mechanical engineering, um, they're most often used to represent stress so um, you know, what's happening to the surface material as it's deforming. Um, the idea is that you have an external force applied to the deformable, uh, deformable body, and the, um, and the stress tensor allows that surface to be deformed, to, to move in certain ways. Um, it, it's sort of, it's a good way of uh, representing how, um, where material might fail, for example. Um, so a typical second-order tensor, uh, so a diffusion tensor, uh, so for example this from DTMRI, um, th this is, um, so this usually comes from a specific piece of instrumentation uh, for, from a diffusion tensor MRI, uh, for example. And you're interested here in how, um, it's really almost like a, a flow instrument. It measures uh, where things flow inside a medium that's being scanned, and how many particles have flow have gone in a certain direction. So you end up having um, any number of, di of directions that sort of aggregate how many things have gone in, in this way, and uh, and and this is uh, th this more or less is your tensor. So it's actually a very different, a completely different. Uh, um, semantic than what you'd have from a stress tensor. Um, and of course the challenge in visualization is you have these two very, very different tensor fields, um, sort of the stress tensor field and then DTI, and can you actually come up with a one-size-fits-all technique to, to render both of them? And the short answer is no. The techniques for rendering stress tensors and for DTI imaging are completely and utterly dif uh, different. Um, so this is sort of an, an illustration of what DTI looks like, uh, where you'd have a scanner that measures how, th how many things have gone this way and how many things have gone this way, um, and, and you end up with sort of, um, I don't know if anyone knows of spherical harmonics, but it's almost more like a, of like, um, a measurement of how many things have gone in a certain direction. Um, but uh, it's, again, guided by, by the type of instrument you have. And you have similar concepts in biological um, data sets when you're measuring how water moves through tissue. Um, it, this is actually a good analogy of what's happening in, uh, uh, in a DTMRI machine, except here instead of, go, instead of a dye going through a Kleenex or a newspaper, it's, um, uh, it's things moving through your brain. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and this is uh, probably going back to more of the stress tensor uh, uh, ex example. So there are um, examples of, um, of stress tensor uh, quantities that um, come up in implant surgery uh, that are uh, simulating materials to be used in surgical devices. Um, and you end up uh, with um, uh, not vector fields, but tensor fields that look more or less like this. And you want to have some way of um, expressing um, flow within those fields or 
um, it, or uh, how strain is represented um, is over the entire field. Um, so, uh, lastly, you have uh, tensors and geometry. These are, I'd say, more used in CAD and modeling applications, uh, which are, uh, you have, for example, curvature tensors, which uh, measure how a surface normal changes over a given direction. And you have metric tensors, which uh, uh, relate uh, direction to angles and distances. Um, so, so it's really mostly about um, the sorts of things you'd want to engineer uh, in a CAD application. This is um, a demonstration. And of how that impacts the integrity of what you actually design. Um, so a lot of the time, you can turn um, a, a th three-dimensional uh, tensor matrices into just uh, component eigenvectors by, di by diagonalization. And once you do that, the eigenvector is actually enough to represent the entire tensor. Um, I'm going to skip through a lot of this because I think we're running short on time. Um, but the idea is that in a lot of cases, um, yes, when you flatten out this tensor and you're only looking at, um, at the diagonalized tensor or the, the first eigenvector, that's actually kind of enough to give you a sense of what the, te the, the tensor is looking like, uh, at least at a local level. Um, so uh, the ch there are challenges to this. Obviously, um, there, I guess there are really a whole uh, set of techniques for tensor visualization here. Uh, there's a, a matrix of each component, component of the uh, tensor. This is a really, really bad technique, uh, <laughs> but it's uh, I actually say used a lot in medical imaging um, in practice. Um, it's fine if you have relatively few images and relatively few tensor components. Um, then you um, you have ways of um, uh, reducing this to a vector field and doing, uh, so if you take the curl of the tensor, that turns into a vector, and you can do standard lick-like vector field visualization on that. That's um, a fairly straightforward way of visualizing a, a tensor field. Um, another way is this to do is what I described, where you flatten out the tensor into its component eigenvector, um, and you map this to, to an ellipsoid or a set of ellipsoid glyphs. Uh, so this was uh, a really seminal technique from the early 90s. Uh, it was used by David Laidlaw in uh, early DTI uh, brain, uh, Im brain imaging, um, uh, where you have uh, a slice of a brain decomposed into a set of ellipsoids, and that more or less shows how fluids can move inside the brain. Um, this is a demonstration. So of I would say early and very imprecise connectomics, um, but also used for um, uh, not just neuroscience, but also um, also uh, analysis of uh, brain tissue, for example, uh, cancer detection and treatment. Um, so there, there's a, an extension of that involving this brush strokes work, which is sort of like a non-photorealistic way of illustrating ellipsoids. Um, but you still have these problems with ellipsoids where there, uh, there's not a lot of continuity it's between them when you flatten out uh, the tensor. Uh, and you're only looking at one, ag one eigenvector. Um, so there's an alternative to this uh, to use box glyphs where you actually look at both eigenvectors, but you end up with these very sharp edges and still not a lot of uh, continuity between one, one, uh, one um, glyph and the next very often. Uh, and uh, th this, um, so um, th this end up, ended up being solved in um, a few ways, mostly by work by Gordon Kimmelman, who's now at the University of Chicago. Of the wire cast. Um, first, what he did was um, he had a, not just um, a, 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 a simple mapping um, of, uh, of the tensor uh, of one eigenvector to the um, to the uh, tensor ellipsoid and, and its uh, and its centroid, but he had a whole family of mappings um, of linear, planar, and spherical. Uh, based on um, this measure of anisotropy um, of, um, of all three um, eigenvectors this that you would have. Uh, so this was already a good start. I mean, we're still using ellipsoids, but, um, but it's, it's still, um, you have a way of actually encapsulating the whole tensor as opposed to just one eigenvector of it. Um, now, the challenge with this is that ellips ellipsoids look great, but they very often look very similar. Um, and it's very tough to, uh, to, for your brain to sort of rationalize which one is which. 
So the way uh, Gordon Kittleman solved this was actually to not visualize boxes and not visualize ellipsoids, but visualize something in between, something called a super quadric, uh, which is sort of um, a analytical implicit um, rounded cube um, that can go from anything from a rounded cube to an ellipsoid, uh, depending on um, on multiple um, uh, multiple factors in, in, in uh, in tensor anisotropy. So all of the eigenvectors um, and, uh, and uh, these uh, anisotropic an measures. Of wire and when you do this, you end up with these great visualizations that show um, wh where continuities could be, but also where, uh, where you end up having um, sort of elongated structure versus uh, more uh, vortex-like structure. So you're able to capture a lot um, and not have to deal with the occlusion problems of glyphs. Um, and there are even, um, uh, so there are higher order uh, other glyphs that were, being, that were used. Uh, so there's this work from, uh, from Barr in 1981. More recently, Mario Klovichka has been doing a lot of work in this area with Reynolds glyphs. Um, I actually collaborated with him on some of that. Uh, but the, the short answer, the short story is that glyphs, even though they're very cluttery and very hard to use in the general case, they're actually quite good for DTMRI, and you, you get some really, really nice visualizations um, of, um, of uh, DTI brain imagery when you use this modality. Um, so I'll just quickly go over hyperlick. Uh, so hyperlick is a lot like lick for, um, for vector fields, except it's um, using, a, it, it's coming straight from a tensor field. Uh, note that a tensor field is not the same as just a flattened vector field. There's no sense of direction the way there is in a tensor field. Instead, it looks something a little bit more like this. Uh, but the lick technique ends up being very, very similar. It's a vection through, um, uh, through the tensor field. And when you do that, instead of streamlines, you have hyper streamlines, which are vected through the tensor field as opposed to some projected version of the vector field from the tensor data. And um, you can combine them with glyphs and get great visualizations like that. Um, there's some problems with this that they, uh, that they wanted to address. And I, I say that's about as far as that literature has gotten. But to summarize, um, I'll leave the slide up here. I think class is all done. Thank you so much for listening, listening to the very, very condensed spatial visualization lectures. Um, Anyone who's interested, please consider this taking Bay Wong's computational topology uh, a lecture next semester. Um, that I, I think that it probably won't talk much about tensor field visualization. Uh, I hope to give you the bird's eye overview of a lot of these topics uh, in the four lectures that I gave. Um, I think topology will be a lot more in depth and there will be a lot of math, but I strongly encourage people to take it um, if. Uh, Maybe not even for, for credit if you're not wor if you're uh, worried about having to uh, reproduce this mathematics. Um, it, it will be fun. Um, but yeah, in short, I'll just leave this up here. Um, scalar field biz is about how we interpolate. Vector and tensor field biz is about how we integrate. Multi fields about how we are about how we summarize all of this, and topology is about how we represent connectivity. And I'd say those techniques together are really what we're trying to do in spatial visualization and scientific visualization still. Um, and uh, thanks very much.